Okay, I'm going to tell you the life, about the life of St. John Maximovich of Shanghai and San Francisco. He was born in 1896 in the village of Adamovka in Russia on June 4th. On June 4th. He was given the name Michael at baptism. He had a speech impediment, so it was hard to tell what he was said, and he had a limp, so he had to walk with King. He was a devout child. He enjoyed reading the lives of saints, and he dressed up his toy soldiers as monks and made forts out of, or he made monasteries out of toy forts. <laughs> um, when he was 30 years old, he was tonsured a monk and given the name John. In 1934, when he was 38 years old, he was consecrated bishop. Oh, I forgot to say, this is just the outline of his life, and then I'll tell the stories and miracles. Um, he was consecrated bishop and sent to Shanghai. They called him Vladika, which is the term for bishop. He also later in Shanghai, he was consecrated archbishop. At the end of the 1940s, during World War II, when there were Japanese occupants in China, all the Russian refugees had to flee to the island of Tobobo in the Pacific Ocean. In 1951, he was sent to Paris and was the arch there was the bishop of the church there. In 1962, he moved to San Francisco. He built many churches and monasteries everywhere he went. Even if he was the, just even if he was there for only a couple weeks, he established a church. He reposed on the, on the July on July 2nd, er, yeah, 1966 while on a pilgrimage to Seattle with the first group icon of the Mother of God. But his funeral was in California, and that's where his relatives are. Now for the miracles and the stories. Um, he taught at the seminary in 1928, and he would stay up later at night, and he would go into each of the students' rooms and pick up the blankets that had fallen on the ground and fix their pillows and then make the sound of the cross over them. He, uh, he, built on this, he built an orphanage in 1935 in Shanghai. Um, in Shanghai, they started with eight children, and and 3,500 children had found comfort there. Once for Christmas, the children gave him wool socks they had they knit themselves. But the next day, they saw a poor man wearing them. Saint John had given them away. He also would give away his sandals sometimes, so he would walk, a, walk around barefoot. When he was in Paris, the parishioners there complained to the Metropolitan about how he, how he was barefoot and didn't wear shoes. The Metropolitan wrote to St. John and told him to wear his shoes. So St. John picked up his shoes and, held them under, and carried them under his arms because he was using his shoes. <laughs> Um, the parishioners complained again, and the Metropolitan wrote to Vladika telling him, Don't obey what I said. You wear your shoes. Vladika wrote back and said, I did use my shoes, but after that he did wear them on his feet. <laughs> he visited, oh, um, in Paris he had a cell on the second floor of a building, and he, but he had no bed. He only had icons and books, because he would not sleep during night. He would stay up all night praying. Sometimes he would accidentally fall asleep while he was doing prostration. He hardly ate anything, too. He wanted to always keep his mind on prayer and on God. Once, he was walking around outside barefoot in the cold to keep himself awake. And he stepped on something sharp and it, um, cut his foot and he was bleeding. He didn't want to go to the hospital at first, but then he was forced to. But he didn't want to lay in the bed because he didn't want to fall into the temptation of sleep. So, but he had to lay down in the bed, of course. So he put a boot under him so that he would, so that he'd be uncomfortable and would not accidentally fall asleep. <laughs> he visited many people, the sick and the poor, every, wherever he was, and he always prayed for them. Once um, in Shanghai, in China, the Chinese and the Japanese were shooting at each other, but it was in the middle of the night. So of course, very dangerous. A Japanese occupants, but Saint John didn't care. He still went, and he got to where they were shooting, and they told him, you shouldn't come here, it's dangerous. He didn't care. He walked through, and this shooting stopped as he was going through, and resumed again when he got to the other side. Same thing on his way back. On the island of Tubabo, they, they camped there. And at night, St. John would walk around the whole campground of Blessed so that no typhoons would destroy it. 
A few years later, when they left, a huge typh typhoon came and destroyed the whole island, the whole campground. There is a myth about St. John that says that he, is, he was always serious. That's not true. During the service, yes, he was always serious. When he was any service, he was uh, when he was serving any service. Um, but afterwards, he would play with the he would mess around with the altar boys and he would tell jokes to them and um, Bishop Peter. Once he told the joke, it was what is green hangs from the ceiling and barks. But I didn't know, so he said a herring, a fish. And well, why is it green? Because I want it to be. Why is it on the ceiling? Because I put it there. And why does it bark? So you wouldn't be able to guess what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Once in San Francisco, Anna, his voice teacher, was very ill and in the hospital. She wanted Vladika to come, but they couldn't let her come. They couldn't bring him because it was storming outside. They had to close the hospital early. But in the middle of the night, St. John came there without anyone having told him. Besides God, of course. Um, and he put money under, under her to pay for his voice lessons because she knew he knew she was very poor. And the next, and she, and of course, he prayed for her. And the next day, she was well. She wasn't sick anymore. And she knew Vladika had been there because of the money. There once there was a young boy named Mark who had a spot on his eye and a limp. His friend wrote to Saint John and asked him to pray for him. Saint John prayed for him, and a couple weeks later. He was all healed. The spot was gone, and he could run like a normal boy. After, uh, well, in 1993, they went to where um, St. John's relics were. It's in a cell somewhere, and they wanted to know if it was incorrupt. At first, it was hard to open the casket, but then they were able. The right, it was the Archbishop, I think, was able to open it, and they found that his relics were incorrupt. And then the next year, 1994, they canonized him. Once, uh, just two years ago, 2017, in his home village, on July 2nd, his home village of Adamanka, on July 2nd, the day we commemorate him, the day he passed away, they, there was a large celebration, and the icon there began to stream myrrh. Um, many miracles happen. oh, and we can venerate, his relics are still incorrupt, we can venerate them at Holy Virgin Cathedral in San Francisco. Many miracles happened after he had died. Once, um, when they had discovered him, they brought a boy there, a young boy who had been ill, and immediately he was made well. Once there was, during a war, a young soldier had, he, he put a picture of St. John in his pocket, and he was kept safe throughout the whole war. All his, everyone else died, but he was always kept safe. Another time, just in the day of his funeral, the the orphanage director was very worried. She didn't know what to do without Vladika now. So Vladika appeared to her in a dream and told her that even though I am dead, I will be with you. I will help you even more than when I was alive. And, yeah. And, okay. So here's a, there's proof that he was not always serious. He's smiling at the picture. There. And this is the icon that, this is a copy of the icon that streamed Mer. He's holding a church because he established many or many churches and monasteries. And then that is the first group icon. Did I say that? He, first group icon. He was on a pilgrimage to Seattle with the first group icon. That's that there he would wear around him. Okay, so here, here is a um, map of where he traveled. So he was born in Adamovka in Russia. Then, during the Revolutionary War, his family had to move to Belgrade, Serbia. And then, when he was a, um, uh, okay, then, okay, there, um, right there, the Shanghai, where he was the <coughs> Archbishop, you guys see. And right there is the island they had to flee to, and there is San Francisco. <laughs> so, Caleb had a video of St. Felicio's talking. But <coughs> I have an actual video of videos of him.
I forgot to say. <laughs> just like St. Seraphim and St. Paisios, he could also read. He also knew people's thoughts before they come to him. And just like some other saints, he also, once there was a, um, there's no water, what's it called? Um, a drought. A drought. <laughs> <laughs> and at a monastery. And so he blessed, he walked around the whole um, garden and blessed it. And immediately, there were stones. I guess it's One of the things that marked the island, and can I got come up close to see? Yeah. You can come up. Um, the typhoons, they are really big storms. Kind of like a hurricane. Yes. So, what was that video they made? Um, I think probably in San Francisco in 19, probably soon before he died, so 1990. He came to San Francisco in 1992, so in between, or 1962, sorry. Um, so in between 1962 and 1966. Yeah. Um, this isn't really a question, but he kind of reminds me of his father. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have a silly question, but do we know how tall he was? Oh, yeah, this is probably, I don't, don't know for sure, but probably, I wouldn't be surprised if he was maybe five feet. Sure. Yeah. And he had a hunch, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, when was he canonized? Oh, it's great. He was canonized in 1994. Is that the same as Paisios? Or is that the That's when St. Paisios passed away. He was canonized in 2014, I think. Paisios was? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Really nice. You mentioned, by the way, that his body was incorrupt. Can you explain that? Means, people might not know that. It means his body was still whole. It, like, it's not bones. It's not, yeah, it's not the skeleton. skin was still on. The skin was still on, yeah, just like his body. Yeah. I believe that he girls have visited his relics, is that right? Every year. Oh, every year. <laughs> I, 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 I've gone there too? too last summer. Yeah, wow. I actually saw his hands. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> So I have one little story about, you mentioned Bishop Peter, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bishop Peter served with him as an altar boy. Oh, wow. I'm not sure if he was, hmm. actually, I don't think he was old enough to be ordained by Archbishop John. Bishop Peter also had a twin brother. His name was Sergei, or Serge. Hmm. Okay, and he also served in the altar with, with uh, Archbishop John. And Sergei, Serge, grew up to marry the daughter of our first priest in modern oh, times wow. here, Father John Lemison. Uh, uh, wow. Matt Serge uh -huh. and, and all of his family. So we have a little connection. Uh -huh. have a little connection, cool. family connection with uh -huh. our Bishop John. Uh -huh. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, great job, Bonnie. Thank you.